Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is a demo of Backstage being integrated with Digital Rebar. This is similar to a video that we did for Cloud Field Day, but we are gonna go into more details about how Backstage works and some of the nuances of integrating with RackN. So we're gonna spend a little bit more time and hopefully you'll get an understanding of some of the benefits and challenges and potential uses of Backstage in the integration process. If you do wanna check out the Cloud Field Day demo, you can follow this YouTube link to find it or watch the whole video and understand more about how Digital Rebar operates. In this demo, we're gonna walk through these processes. We're gonna show how to set up predefined clusters using Digital Rebar's cluster API. We are going to grow and shrink those clusters. Uh, we're gonna leave running a custom Ansible to somebody who wants to follow our labs. It's very easy to inject a parameter that will run custom Ansible, so we will skip that step but we'll also show how you can do garbage collection both inside and outside of Backstage through Digital Rebar's interfaces. So a lot of basic uh, use of Backstage as our developer interface while maintaining Digital Rebar as our operations interface. It's important to understand that we're doing this work to support the business by enabling Backstage for developer productivity. And that means we should be able to track critical KPIs. We're looking to improve availability by having a very low effort to reset environments for developers. We wanna make the system reliable by having a very low failure rate. So when developers ask for things through the Backstage portal, they get them reliably and do not create a lot of operational burden on running and maintaining the system behind the scenes. And most critically, the system needs to be fast. That means that the systems are delivering infrastructure quickly, but even more important, they're reducing custom automation. That means taking the time out from having a DevOps or a platform engineering team having to rewrite one-off scripts, and that saves a lot in productivity for the team. The example here is going to be using our integration infrastructure with Backstage. Now, Backstage has a front end and a back end. We're gonna skip the part of actually setting Backstage up and assuming you can follow our instructions for doing this. And it's worth noting that all of this is based on a Backstage tutorial written by a RackN intern. Xander Franks has uh, published this on his GitLab system. And this Backstage tutorial includes a write-up of how to repeat the steps that we are about to show you and includes access to the plugins that we use to create the back end, the scaffolding, and the front end. In this demo, all of that has been installed. Now I'll walk you very briefly through it, and we will show you the code that was written and then extend the code to create the cluster interfaces to actually drive the system. But first, let's explain how those front end and back end systems will interact. Users will operate backstage through the front end it will talk to the back end, which will then talk to Digital Rebar. In this case, we're asking for a cluster of machines using Digital Rebar's cluster API. That cluster will then automatically spin up machines into that system and manage it at the cluster level. If you choose to resize the cluster, and we're gonna demonstrate how this works, that's a day two operation where the developers are able to get more resources or give up resources within the cluster. We'll demonstrate how that works. We'll also show how developers can create new clusters dynamically using the exact same automation. So instead of having to customize automation if a name changes, they can simply ask for new clusters and they will be added into the system. We're also gonna show how the developer can use a delete operation to clean up the cluster. Because of the cleanup operations enabled by Digital Rebar, we're actually gonna be deleting and removing the backing infrastructure from that cluster. So it makes it very easy for developers to work at a high level, but yet not create uh, leftover resources around uh, after they're done with that. So clean up very fast and efficient. We're going to go through this and then come back around for some questions. Before I go too far, I do want to stress that Backstage IO is a developer portal, an IDP, and we have customers who want specialized interfaces for operators, sysadmins, or newer operators that don't have all of the power and capabilities of Digital Rebar's UX, but still want the operational feel of the UX that we've created 
for digital rebar. And this is a different use case than that. In that use case, you can choose to have views in digital rebar that limit the scope and control of a user of digital rebar in an operational context. What we are talking about with Backstage is actually ensuring that developers don't have to use an operator's tool to accomplish their work. And we're relieving the cognitive burden of needing to switch into a different tool by using something like Backstage. Let me show you our Backstage environment. This Visual Studio uh, IDE is set up and attached to my Backstage server. I am running a dedicated Backstage server for this. And because of the front end, back end, I could actually split this into multiple servers if I needed. In this case, I do need to actually start my Backstage server. What I wanna show you here is that this is Backstage that's been installed with all the pieces and parts. If I go into the plugins directory, this is where Backstage takes extensions, you'll see that we have cloned the Backstage uh, plugin for digital rebar and the Backstage plugin for digital rebar backend. So we have a front end and a back end component that get installed here. Uh, since I'm running both components in this environment, both are installed and you can see the code here on the left where we've attached to that server. I actually need to start uh, Backstage and I'm gonna do that by creating a dev instance. That is gonna open two different websites, one on port 3000, that's the front end, and one on port 707, that is the back end. Both have to be accessible for Backstage to work because the front end calls into the Backstage to take actions. When we bring up our Backstage front end and visit the Digital Rebar form page, you can see that we've already created a cluster within the system in a table. I'll show you in a second what this code looks like, but this is literally just pulling from our digital rebar system. And if I was to go in and say, resize the number of machines in the cluster, the API here is already structured so that we can go into this cluster, see the cluster count change, and it's plumbed over to make uh, day two operational changes to grow or shrink the cluster. And you can actually see that process going through right now. So here's the machines in my already existed cluster and uh, I've been able to interact with them through Backstage. So this is very handy if we have existing resources, if we make changes to the resources, I could do the same thing uh, from this side. If I say, no, I'm gonna reduce that cluster back down to four, uh, initiate the work order that makes the changes to that cluster. What you'll see over here is that Backstage immediately picks up what that change is, and then we get those components. So very basic integration between showing the resources that I have and providing some simple day two operational controls for a developer. Let me show you what that looks like when we actually, when we look at the, the code. Over here, we have the ERP fetch cluster code, and this is taking advantage of the Digital Rebar API, we have a JavaScript version of our API that we can import, we publish it, can import it and then use the Digital Rebar objects just like we use in our UX to manage and control Digital Rebar resources. And that's exactly what we've done here. We've defined the, um, this is doing the cluster actions, but we have defined the, the system, let's see, scroll down a little bit, here are the columns. So this is the basic fetch cluster. This is where we've defined the columns. So this is the name of the column, the size of the column, the broker and the action. You can see we've done some things where we're just pulling data directly out of the information we get back. Uh, in this case, deeply into the object, we're actually getting the broker name from the params. Uh, or we are, have wrapped things like a cluster count object that gives us our plus and minus buttons. And that is defined, this is all React. So it's defining it as um, a subcomponent that we get to pull in. And this is very consistent, straightforward backstage coding uh, using JavaScript. Uh, and you can see this is exactly what we've been able to do. It doesn't require a lot of, um, obviously if you wanna see the JavaScript, you should go through and look at this code. But fundamentally, we are using what backstage provides us out of the box. And that allows us to then take advantage of all of the boilerplate in here, build a, build a page with columns. And then we have gone through and added some additional capabilities that you could easily expand and add. 
the actions here are being called from the back end. The back end we have defined in the router uh, goes back into different DRP APIs and then takes different actions. So uh, you can see we've gone through even more than what I have in the demo. We have different uh, operations uh, exposed so that you can go through and explore how to move the system around and, and, and change different components. Um, the router here, you'll notice we have some simple router calls, but when you're doing scale, we actually need to both change the, the count in the cluster and then generate that day two instruction, the work order. So what I did in the UX where I clicked change the size and then schedule the work order, we have incorporated both things into this one action. Once again, this is the power of having a developer API. You can bundle actions that the operators want to do together into a single action. And then those get back ended into um, clusters. This is literally the API call going back and doing the uh, actions in the API and then returning the uh, information back. I'm about to show you how we call that part of the code using templates. So when we create new infrastructure, we want to do this using a template. And we've defined three templates for this demo. And I'm going to walk you through each one because they build and add complexity as we go. This first template is our basic starting point. And I'm just going to call this step one in our and go through and let it create um, a template. Before I do this, I want to actually show you the code behind the scenes. This is this cluster create cluster template. We don't need to see as much of this, so let me hide that. This is um, just a template. Basically, a catalog entry is what it would look like in uh, Backstage. And it has a pretty consistent uh, template-driven uh, definition where I can come in and tell it what parameters I want to ask for, in this case, just a name. And then I can tell it what steps I want to take. This is the scaffolder where I interact and create a very basic orchestration. And you'll see I can in incorporate code into that orchestration. So in my step, I only have one. I'm going to create the cluster and I'm going to use the parameter name. And from an output, I'm going to provide a link back into the output from that action. Pretty straightforward uh, and very simple to add and expand. And this is a a very powerful part of Backstage is creating these templates and making them available for your developers. So let me go ahead and push create on this. And what you'll see happened is it created the cluster, those outputs, zoom in a little bit, those outputs that we had defined were here and that jump to cluster, I could come over here and it'll bring me back into that cluster. This is where I have that step one defined and um, we've now built that machine, but you'll notice I don't have the things that you would expect. I don't have the broker that I need to make the system run. I don't have the count. There is no activity going on. Uh, there's no machines that have been built. So clearly, while we were able to validate a very simple integration where I called Digital Rebar's APIs, it wasn't sufficient uh, to drive this process forward, but it did do a simple job of testing and validating that uh, we were able to work in Backstage, let me refresh here, you'll see, once again, that new machine has been created. So we need to do a little bit better job of uh, interacting with Digital Rebar than just giving a name for a cluster. Our Create Cluster 2 template has more steps, has more input into creating this cluster, and let's review that. So here we're saying we've required a name, a broker, and count. Name is the same as we've defined before. But here we're going to define a broker. In this case, I can actually provide a default. Same thing is true with my count here. I'm going to provide a count. And then when I call it, instead of just passing name, I'm actually going to pass in more of my object definition. Now, if you recall, when we looked at the actual code creating it, I don't have any of this defined. I'm literally passing a JSON object directly through Backstage into Digital Rebar's APIs, and there it's doing the right thing. So I'm going to define parameters for my, my broker name and my cluster count. That's the only change I made in this step. And let's see how that turned out. So this is the step two template. I'm going to go ahead and choose that. 
Notice now we have context broker and the count defined. I'm going to change that so you can see that it would actually do something. Hit next step, hit to review our components and say create. Once again, it's talking to the API, doing everything that we would expect it to do. If I jump over to digital rebar, you'll see step two is defined, but still hasn't taken any action. So we still have something additional to do. In this step though, we have successfully created a cluster count and a broker name. So some of the basic information is set up. Digital Rebar follows this pattern where you can create objects, but then not automatically start behaviors on those objects, uh, because that to us uh, should be a operator discretion action. So we've created act, we've created a system here, but not automatically begun a workflow or taken a, an operation that allows you to make a whole bunch of changes and parameters and updates, and then set an object into motion. For this demo, we don't want that behavior. We actually want to program it to take the full action. So let's look at that third template. In the third template, we've uh, defined an additional input parameter called owner. I decided that I want to be able to sort based on owner so I can quickly find which developer created the resources as an operator. And you'll see here, We've, take, we've, we've kept our broker name and cluster count, but we've added that owner so I can define this owner parameter in an ad hoc way. And then we're adding some important operational information that Digital Rebar expects. Here we've added a on delete workflow so that we are going to, we can destroy the cluster and it knows what to do from a cleanup perspective. That That is what tells it to delete infrastructure. And you can modify and extend this so that you have a custom cleanup to make sure that maybe non-digital rebar resources or entries are also cleaned up. We're gonna tell it what workflow we wanna start, in this case, the basic universal start, so <laughs> very common place to get things running. And we're gonna be using this universal application-based cluster to run that cluster application. It's a pretty typical way to uh, pipeline to run on any infrastructure that you build. Uh, and then if I needed to say run an Ansible script, I could actually define that here and include it into that uh, pipeline as a pre, post, or runbook operation so that it would automatically include it in that setup. Now, we aren't exposing these things to the backstage user. What we're doing here is actually going back and giving the backstage developer the opportunity to inject things into digital rebar outside of the developer's control. And then you could create a new template to call this that would then have different behaviors based on how you wanted things to go. Very powerful to be able to have the developers and the, the backstage owners, your platform engineers, to be able to tweak and tune how you get and interact with infrastructure and then have operators very clearly be able to support it. In this case, in an example of that, I'm also defining metadata to set an icon and color for this template. That way I can tell exactly from a glance which template created this uh, cluster. A very handy operational um, clue to see how things are going. So let's go ahead and try running this final template. So our third template here is this create cluster. We're going to go ahead and choose this one. We're going to call it step three. Context broker, we're going to leave count at three. I'm going to give my name as the owner here and go ahead and let this get started. So we're going to create that. Over here, you'll notice that we have step three defined, and it's already doing work to define the cluster. So our actions to start a workflow succeeded in having the system automatically build, and you'll notice it's building those machines and making them progress. So at this point, we have a way to now, it's already done, go ahead and create machines and run them through a process. This is done very fast because I'm using uh, context broker uh, machines, which are basically containers, but you could do the same thing for a bare metal pool or even cloud machines where we're running Terraform for you. So context broker could choose Amazon East or Google, uh, Linode, any one of the things that you've defined as a resource broker and then run that infrastructure to completion. Uh, all a developer would have to do is choose a different context broker and they could get resources wherever they wanted. And you could even do things like define size or operating systems. There's a lot of options in how these things work. Let's go ahead and create a second um, cluster here. So we're going to create a new cluster. 
And we are going to use, um, we'll call this one step four, don't need to be creative here, another cluster, and then we'll give this one another owner. Uh, we're going to call this Lara. And we're going to go through and let this create another cluster. You can see step four has already been created. One of the reasons why I want to highlight this owner choice is that we can actually uh, go through and in this owner filter, we could actually group by the owners. And then I can show you the clusters that belong to each owner. So this allows us to very quickly, if we were doing this type of work, uh, create operational context that you can check and see who's doing what, filter things down and, and then help users very quickly. So if uh, Laura had had some challenges getting her cluster spun up, then you would be able to go through, look exactly what resources were, review the activity logs and see if there were changes or support that needed to be had uh, just by, by knowing the owner of that cluster. Now on the other side of this, we can come back through uh, since we know that in our cluster, step one and step two are wrong, I could come back and delete those as an operator and do that garbage collection and cleanup. If I go back to here, what you'll see is that uh, those machines I removed are gone. The ones that I kept were there. If um, a developer is coming into this UX and then making changes, you'll see those changes. That uh, update is already going through the process and we're getting to see new machines going. So. As an operator, I actually can see when developers are making requests against this a, a, against this uh, portal, and and get very good operational control and know exactly what's happening and who's doing that work. If I go in and say want to do my delete from here, I can delete that. Jump in here, you'll see that um, here it's actually going through the cleanup process. It's <laughs> very quick. It's already removed that cluster, and I see all of those operations happen automatically. Uh, for the system. So tremendous controls uh, in this. One thing I would note is that uh, Digital Rebar does have role-based and, and tenant and user authentication. So um, you don't have to, I'm using a super admin token for this login, but I could only see the infrastructure that I have the, the, the control and management to see. So with that, we've really covered the core components of this Backstage integration. We've shown you how to create a list of machines in Backstage and then extend their capabilities by adding uh, parameter controls for Digital Rebar that not just change things, but then initiate uh, actions. So very good, thorough controls for day one and day two inside of this view. And then we've shown you how to build templates that interact with digital rebar and then have increasing complexity so that you can automatically map information into those developer experiences behind the scenes and maintain control over what their outcomes are without having to force them to make a lot of choices. Uh, you can even tag things so that you can see who's doing what and quickly identify what's going on within the system. And since we have incredible control for bare metal, that could mean something as powerful as creating pools of bare metal resources and then making them accessible to users so they can check out individual machines or groups of machines, install their OS, uh, run Ansible scripts, do security routines. Um, and a nice thing here is that because you see the, the automation, you can tap into our day two capabilities to run nightly security scans and audits, to do checks and double checks of what's going on, to share the infrastructure between teams so that they can really take advantage of completely automated systems, treating your infrastructure as if it was a cloud infrastructure. I encourage you to check out uh, the backstage tutorial if this is interesting to you. Uh, Xander's done a really nice job of writing up the documentation, going through the process and helping you see the work that we did. You can then overlay this demo and actually start playing with your own digital rebar infrastructure. Uh, it really is very simple to do this type of integration. And I want to emphasize here that while I'm showing you backstage, any IDP system that you have, whether home built or commercial, could be used and integrated with digital rebar, especially if it's JavaScript, but our REST APIs are, are very strong and powerful. So any system that you're using to take 
developer burden could be easily integrated into digital rebar. You can provide incredible operational experience and controls for your operations and platform engineering team while reducing the, that burden from your developers and allowing them to accelerate and focus on their work. As always, we are excited to work and collaborate with you. If you have any questions or want to spend more time figuring out how this works and need a hand or some hints, please get in touch with RackN. You can visit us at, us at rackn.com. You can be part of our Slack community. We are always eager to hear about your vision for your infrastructure and how we can help you make that happen. Thanks. Looking forward to seeing you.